A very warm welcome from my side also. It's a great pleasure and honor to give this keynote lecture at the Global Online Meetings 2020. I would like to speak about civic engagement today, and this is a topic that has fascinated me for a long time because civic engagement is so fundamental, so important for having a well-functioning democracy and an accountable state. Yet, standard economics has not much to say about civic engagement. This is a, a non-starter in standard economics, and I would like to present a number of papers that I have done uh, recently with a series of co-authors that highlight the role of civic engagement in providing a functioning democracy and an accountable state. More precisely, there are two broad topics. First topic is the relation between civic engagement and information in voting. The background of why I got interested in this topic or in this relation is a perennial concern with democracy. The concern is that voters have little political knowledge, are incompetent and irrational. Examples are the quip by Winston Churchill, who reportedly said the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. He was, in fact, in favor of democracy. He also said that it's the worst system, except all others that have been tried from time to time. Another quip to illustrate this concern is from Adlai Stevenson, who ran for presidential office in the 50s, and he, he was a governor at the time. So he was touring the country. He was approached by an ardent supporter who said, Dear Governor Stevenson, every intelligent American will vote for you. To which he retorted, Well, that's not going to be enough. I need a majority. So these quips illustrate this concern with democracy, which really uh, goes back to uh, Plato and others, philosophers who, had, um, who were very concerned with the quality of democratic choice. And part of this lack or, or this, this concern can be traced back to uh, the concern that the voters are not sufficiently motivated to, to be informed and to turn out because these are costly actions. It's tedious to do. And if people don't have the sufficient civic engagement to do this, to be informed, then the quality of democratic choice is going to be poor. So this is the hypothesis and, uh, and one label under which this hypothesis is known is the so-called rational ignorance hypothesis, where people you know, trade off the, the personal, private costs and benefit of, of being informed and the prediction is that they will actually collect very little information. So I will discuss an experiment that I have done with Lydia Mechtenberg. Uh, showing that this rational ignorance is not as pronounced as you would predict on the basis of rational choice theory and that civic engagement is actually beneficial. The second paper that is related to this topic is on fake news. And I will show that if voters are naive and do not recognize that they are prone to this fake news, but they are civically engaged and they think they should participate, that this is an obligation, that this may lead to excessive participation and this excessive participation may actually ruin the quality of democratic choice. So in, in a sense, this type of non-sophisticated civic engagement may backfire. This is a paper with Melis Kartal. The second topic has to do with the relation of civic engagement and the accountable state. The background, why I got interested in this, is the, the basic idea that a strong state can provide valuable public goods. And this is extremely uh, productive and valuable, as we have seen in the recent corona crisis. But a strong state can also misuse the power and be oppressive. So there is this dilemma. How can we have a strong state, but at the same constrain or shackle, as I will say later on, the, the government? So one way to constrain self-serving government might be civic engagement that leads people to monitor the government, to vote them out of office if they don't perform in the, in the sense if they are not accountable to voters. So the, the point here is civic engagement is needed to make the state accountable. And the main finding in this paper with Kenju Kame and Louis Burterman that I'm going to present is that civic engagement, the extent of civic engagement is shaped by the environment. So 
depends on how costly it is, whether there's social pressure. But the surprising finding is that civic engagement is surprisingly persistent. So we don't see the decline that we typically see in public goods gains in voluntary contributions, but it's surprisingly persistent, but the level is such that the accountable state is fragile. And this is an experience that is in line with much of historical experience. So both settings uh, are complex ones. They are complex experiments, and to facilitate understanding, we use real-life context. And so in that sense, both experiments are examples of field-in-the-lab experiments. Let me now mention that there is no agreed-on definition in the literature on what civic engagement is. Here is a, one possible definition I found from the Institute of, for Policy and Civic Engagement. It says, civic engagement is any activity that contributes to a more effective democracy. A democracy in which individuals have a basic understanding about how government works and have access to information about important policy issues that affect their lives. It can be a broad range of activities. It's any activity, that's what I highlighted here. But crucial is that these are activities that contribute to more effective democracy, including the willingness to participate, to be informed. And I also highlighted the information about important policy issues here. So, but uh, civic engagement has been defined in various ways. It also involves volunteering, uh, political activism, and so on. So the experiments I'm going to present capture some aspects of civic engagement that are in line with this definition, but other people have defined it differently. I would like to uh, talk now about how civic engagement can improve the quality of democratic choice. And to explain what I mean by this expression, I first have to explain what I mean by a common interest problem. So these are problems where we all agree on the goal, but we disagree about what is the best way to reach that goal. We are uncertain which is the best measure to reach that goal. This applies to many examples, like fighting crime, fighting unemployment, preventing pollution, promoting prosperity, or preventing a financial crisis. We all agree that we don't want to witness the next financial crisis, but we disagree. We're uncertain how to actually do it. This, is, this type of problem is different from conflict, where you have two groups and they have different, perhaps opposing interests, like in redistribution. What I'm going to say applies to one important type of problems, not to these other uh, problems. Now, the quality of democratic choice in the context of these common interest problems means how likely is an electorate to make the right choice if there is this is an old and important question. And the Marquis de Condorcet thought about this topic at the dawn of the French Revolution. Because in these days, people were starting to think, how are we gonna run this place once we get rid of the king? Is democracy ever gonna work? And so the Condorcet jury theorem is one element that this philosopher or mathematician contributed to show that democracy actually might have something positive to contribute. So there is something that speaks for democracy. And to explain this, he explained it in the context of a jury. The jury is in a common interest situation. They all agree that justice should be served, and they all agree that justice is served if the guilty man is sent to prison and the innocent man is acquitted. But they are uncertain whether this particular defendant is guilty or not. The claim of the Condorcet jury theorem is now that committees, like a jury, make better choices through majority voting than any individual of this group could have made, and such that the probability that the jury makes the right choice is larger than the probability that any individual I pick out of this committee will make the right choice. There are, of course, some assumptions behind this theorem. You need a bunch of voters, more than two. You need two alternatives only. You need to have the case that people are uncertain, but they all have valuable information. So PI larger than 0.5 means that all the committee members are more likely to get it right than wrong. So they have valuable information. And then they vote sincerely. So if they think that the person is guilty, they vote to send them to prison. This is sincere voting. That they do it independently on the basis of their own judgment and that voting is costless. These are some assumptions behind this theorem. And then uh, you can show 
that there is an information aggregation effect, which essentially means that the probability that the jury gets it right is higher than any individual gets it right, and that this information aggregation effect is strong if n is large, so if there are many voters. The Marquis de Condorcet demonstrated something that could be called the wisdom of the crowds effect. If there are many people deciding on some issue by voting, it will be, the choice will be better, the quality of democratic choice will be high. So you could also say there is a dividend of democracy. To illustrate this information aggregation, let's take it in a very simple case with three voters, n equal three, and each voter is 70% likely to make the right choice. So the whole group of three people is, makes the right choice if each individual gets it right. This is the first line. So what's the probability that all three get it right? It's 34.3%. Okay, but then it might also be that just the majority gets it right. So this is the case when two people get it right and one person gets it wrong. Okay, so what's the probability that this happens is 14.7%. But there are three ways for a committee of three to have one, one person being wrong in a committee of three. So we have to multiply that by three, which yields 44.1%. If you do the math, you will see that the probability that this committee gets it right, the first two lines together, is almost 80%, 78.4%, which is more than the 70%, which is the probability that each individual gets it right. So this difference, 78 versus 70, is the information aggregation effect, is the wisdom of the crowd. It's a small crowd here. But if the crowd were bigger, the difference would get bigger. So let me now talk about the first paper with Ludia uh, from the University of Hamburg. So we, the starting point was this concern that democracy may yield poor decisions because voters are not motivated to be informed and to turn out. This hypothesis was first formulated by Anthony Downs already in 1948. And we studied this problem or this question in a situation where the common interest problem is difficult. So the voters a priori have no clue what is the right action. So PI is exactly equal to 0.5. They're as likely to get it right as to get it wrong. They have no clue what is the right action. But if they make an effort to acquire information, then the probability that they get it right will become bigger than the probability that they get it wrong. They're more likely to get it right than wrong. So PI is bigger than 0.5. And why may they do this? Well, they might have a private interest, as I explained later on, but they might also do it for civic engagement. So the problem is that in the setting that we look at, information acquisition is costly. You have to make an effort to acquire this information. And if they do, they improve the decision a democratic decision, but then the choice will be better for everyone. So information acquisition is a public good. And this rational ignorance hypothesis then says that, well, if it's costly to provide the public good, people won't do it enough. And that this undermines information aggregation. And if you have the possibility to either delegate the choice to an expert, at least if he's sufficiently competent, or to vote, it might be better to delegate it to the expert because the voters will not be informed and they just, it's just random 50-50 whether they get it right. And so we use naturalistic context to facilitate comprehensions for the participants who are undergrad students in this setting. So it's an example of what you could call a field in the lab experiments. You know this definition of the lab in the field experiments that John List came up with a while ago and, and Glenn Harrison came up a, a while ago, and here we do the opposite. Yeah? So we bring the field context into the lab. How do we describe this to participants? So we describe it that the, these, are, these participants are uh, citizens in a town, and they have to choose which of two companies to hire for a particular construction project. So in this town, they want to build a bridge, for example, and there are two companies that could build this bridge. And one of the companies is more qualified than the other for the job. And if they pick the right company, all the citizens will equally benefit because the bridge is bigger, or better, and cheaper, for example. So if they make the right choice, all the citizens will benefit. 
So how can this choice be made between the two companies? There are two ways. Either you can delegate the choice to the mayor and the mayor has some competence that is known. Uh, so all the citizens know if we delegate to the mayor, he will make the right choice with probability Q. Okay, and in the experiment, the mayor is just a computer and it's, it's free to delegate the choice to the mayor. Or they can make the choice themselves by voting. Okay, so if, they, if this is the case, then they decide, do I want to gather information? Everyone separately, independently and simultaneously, they decide, do I want to gather the information? If so, I have to pay cost C. And if so, I get an independent signal of some quality. And the quality that we have in this experiment is not very high, is 0.6. So if you don't make the effort, you have no clue, it's 50%, you're equally likely to get it right and wrong. If you pay the money, the cost C, your probability increases from 0.5 to 0.6. And then you get the signal and then you decide whether you want to abstain or not. So there are two treatments here. One treatment is called endo. And in endo, the default is that the mayor decides. But the citizens can also demand the vote by signing a petition. So they literally have to uh, sign with their name. If sufficiently many people sign the petition, then the decision about which company is going to build the bridge is made by true voting. And if not, then the mayor decides. Treatment EXO has no petition. Okay, so instead, it's exogenously assigned, the experimenter assigns whether it's the decision is made by voting or by delegation to the mayor. So the hypothesis now was that voters are more motivated to gather the information when they think that others want to vote. You know, because they observed the others signed this petition, so it must be that they want to vote. So, and they may infer from this that they, if they want to vote, that they probably also want to be informed. If they are conditionally cooperative, they would think, okay, I should perhaps also be uh, informed. So that's the hypothesis here. Uh, efficiency in treatment endo is higher than in treatment exo. And then in both treatments, we vary the cost, the cost of uh, gathering information. We have three levels, low, medium, and high. So the predictions to derive these predictions is actually not so trivial. And the way it's done is by uh, backward induction. So you assume common knowledge of rationality and self-interest and ask, given that people have some state of information, will they participate or not? Uh -huh. And then the upshot here, I, I abbreviate here a little bit. The upshot is that if you don't have information, you should abstain. And if you have information, you should vote your signal. It's kind of clear the information, the, the, the signal is informative, so it's better to vote the signal than the opposite. And it's better not to vote if you don't have a clue because you may cancel out the vote of an informed vote. So let's go now one step more in the backward induction. So should I buy the information? What is my information demand? Buying information is privately profitable if the marginal expected benefit exceeds the marginal cost. So in this experiment, if the group makes the right choice, every group member gets 25 euros. And to buy the information, you have to pay cost C. But the marginal benefit is how much more likely am I to get these 25 euros if I acquire information, and then I vote according to the signal, as we have just seen, than if I don't. Okay, so this is the privately optimal information demand. If the marginal expected benefit uh, exceeds the marginal cost. So now this is complicated because on the one hand, this probability, the, the change in probability decreases with the number of informed voters. So if already many voters are informed and I also buy information, that increases the chance that we will make the right choice only a little bit. But if few people are informed and I buy information, that increases it by more. So delta prob uh, decreases with the number of informed voters. But of course, the probability that the group makes the right choice increases with the number of informed voters. That's the information aggregation effect we talked about. C is constant, the marginal cost is constant, the marginal benefit falls, so at some point the two will intersect, and this is what is the privately optimal information demand. And this occurs at the low level of information because the socially optimal information uh, demand takes into account that other people also earn 25 euros. So you have to multiply in the upper 
uh, equation, uh, the 25 euros times the number of people n. Yeah. And so in this experiment, n is seven. So uh, that means the optimal, socially optimal information demand is high and the privately optimal information demand is low. And that's, and that's essentially the rational ignorance hypothesis. Right, we have three cost levels, uh, and the prediction is that, not surprisingly, information demand responds to the cost. Now we go one step further. When will they sign the petition, or when would they rather delegate to the mayor? We have two levels of experience of the mayor, uh, and when the mayor is very competent, they should always delegate. But with an inexperienced mayor, the probability is so low that it depends. It depends on how many, what you think, how many others buy the information, whether you should delegate or not. If you think many others will buy the information, you should sign the petition and vote. If you think few other people will buy the information, you should delegate. So the upshot is you should delegate when the cost is high, because then few people are predicted to buy the information and vote when it's low. What are the main results? We did these experiments at the University of Vienna with 168 uh, participants and we find that indeed they, are, they delegate to the mayor when he's highly experienced. So this is an important result because it shows that they are not obsessed with voting. You know, it could be that they think voting is so much fun for some uncontrolled factor in the experiment that they always want to vote, but it's not the case. They always delegate. And then with the inexperienced mayor, the behavior is very uh, differentiated and it's in some ways very much in line with the predictions that is they buy more information when it's cheap and therefore delegate less to the mayor when it's cheap. So the main finding is that they are highly motivated to gather information beyond what is predicted by the rational ignorance hypothesis. So rational ignorance is less of a problem. However, we also find an efficiency loss due to uninformed voting. So some people don't buy the information, but vote nevertheless. And that causes an efficiency loss because you cancel out the votes of informed people. Overall, we find that endo versus exo, we find that endo actually is more efficient as we uh, hypothesize that demanding the vote increases efficiency by about the same amount as the uninformed voting decreases. So civic engagement on net, signing the petition, further increased the motivation to be uh, informed. Overall, this study kind of shows that civic engagement is beneficial for the quality of democratic choice. In a related paper, we look at fake news. This is a paper with Melis Kartal. And by fake news, we mean that the individual who has fake news is more likely to make the wrong choice than the right choice. So the probability that you get it right is below 50%. And interestingly, the Marquis de Condorcet has already anticipated this case, and he showed that if this is uniform, everyone has such a probability below 50%, and they all vote. He showed that there is like a dark side of the vote, if you like, which means that the jury is less likely to get it right than any individual uh, in this group. So it's not, in that case, you sh it's not a good idea uh, to vote. But we are looking at a more complex case here. The Marquis was concerned with cases where information would be uniform. Everyone has the same. But we look at cases where information is differential. So some people have better information than others, perhaps because some people have better ability to use the information, cognitive ability. But a fundamental trait of democracy is the principle of one person, one vote. And your vote counts as much, uh, you're informed, your vote counts as much as mine if I'm uninformed. So that's a problem. So, with, so those with inaccurate information, it doesn't even have to be fake information, just inaccurate, your information is better than mine. If the difference is sufficiently big, then I should abstain in common interest situation if I'm only interested in the group making the right choice, if that's the only thing that drives my preferences. So this can be shown theoretically. Actually, much of this paper is actually theory work. Melis is a brilliant theorist who uh, can show all these things uh, very elegantly. So the main idea, or one of the main ideas of these papers, of, the, of this experiment here, is that voters may erroneously think that they are better informed than they really are. So they are overconfident in the quality of their 
uh, information. So they think they have better information than they actually do. And if voters are naive in this sense that of the Dunning-Kruger hypothesis, that they are unskilled and unaware, then they will not abstain despite getting fake news. And then if they participate, that ruins the quality of democratic choice. So here's an example that this is not uh, implausible. Uh, in fact, uh, Pew Research, um, a survey a company, ran a survey with a thousand adult Americans and found that two thirds of these respondents think fake news causes confusion about basic facts. But, but 84% of the respondents are confident in their own ability to detect the fake news. So they think fake news is so in confusion among others, but not among themselves. So this is suggestive evidence that voters are overconfident. So how do we run this experiment? This experiment, in contrast to the previous one, is fairly simple. So it's not a complex setting. So we follow the standard procedures in this literature there are two states of the world which are called red and blue. There are two policies, red and blue. And if the chosen policy matches the state, then you get the price, you get money. And if not, then you don't get money. Every, every individual gets a signal about the state. Okay, your signal is red. And then uh, you vote uh, according to, to the signal. So it's only, uh, only informative voting or staying. Okay, so abstention is possible, but uh, voting has to be according to your signal for simplification. A key point here is that the accuracy of signals is heterogeneous. So some people get correct news and some people get fake news. And how do we implement this? When the participants come to the experiment in part one, we elicit beliefs about fake news. So they all do a quiz. There's 20 quiz questions on easy math and logical puzzles and then we ask them how likely is it that you are in the top third of the score distribution so we make a ranking of all the people who are in this session 24 people we rank them how likely is it that you were among the top eight so they have to give a probability estimate <clears throat> then we don't tell them the outcome they move on to part two where they vote uh, according to what I described, red and blue state and so on, where they vote, but we give them objective information. So we randomly draw a signal from uh, an interval, zero to one. Yeah, we draw a signal and say, this, your signal is red, it's 75% uh, likely to be correct. The next period, your signal is blue, it's 23% likely to be correct. Yeah, it's a random draw. And so we want to see when people get objective information so they know how reliable or how accurate is their information, do they correctly abstain when their quality of information is low or not? So they do this for 15 periods. And then in part three, which is our main interest, so part two is serves like a control treatment. Part three is where voting is with subjective information. So here we use the information from part one. So if someone is really in the top third of the score distribution, this person gets correct news. If you're not in the top third of this distribution, you get fake news. So this means by definition, two thirds of the people get fake news. So we have two variations here, treatment subject is uh, without feedback, subject plus is with feedback, they are told, did they make the right choice and how many people did vote? So we don't tell them whether they're in the top third, of course, yeah, because that would be pointless. These are groups of 24, reasonably large groups that are voting with these experiments at the University of Vienna. So here's the main outcome of with subjective information. So the blue bar on the left shows the turnout rate. You can see it's very high turnout, 80%. And the missing bar where it says 0%, that's the efficiency measure. So this means that not the single decisions, there were 36 decisions that the groups made, not a single one was correct with subjective information. Why was that? Because there was excessive turnout. In this case, subject, almost 80% uh, of the people voted, but they knew that only one third of the voters actually had correct information. So if the turnout is above 66, you're guaranteed to make the wrong choice because only one third has correct information, there's two thirds vote, at least two thirds vote, more than a third has fake news, so it must be wrong. 
So when they get some feedback, it improves a little bit, turnout rate falls a little bit, but not much. Whereas in contrast with objective information, we see very high efficiency. Overall, it's 93%. If we only look at the last five periods, it's 100% efficiency, though they always get it right. You can see with the blue bars that uh, they actually learn to abstain and uh, information aggregation works very well with objective information in this simple setting, but doesn't work at all. It's total failure with subjective information. And then the paper shows in very, in very careful argument that this is actually due to overconfidence. So what do we find here in this study is there is no wisdom of the crowd effect in this setting that we study here. And why is this so? Because the voters with misleading information, with this fake news, participate excessively because they think they can tell fake news from correct news and they think they have correct news and that's why they, they vote. What does it have to do with civic engagement? So this is a bit of a subtle thing because it depends actually on the definition of civic engagement you'd like to apply. Here's another definition that I uh, took from the literature. And this definition says civic engagement means to develop a combination of knowledge, skills, values, and motivation needed to enact a change. So it can be several things. So it can be values and motivation. And that could translate into a naive obligation to participate, as many people seem to think. I have to vote. This is my civic duty, independent of whether I have a clue or not, independent of whether I have fake information or not. And that is very counterproductive. Or is it a more sophisticated value, which says I should only participate if I actually have sufficient knowledge? Yeah. So that's not so clear, this relation. The second part in this citation is that it has something to do with knowledge and skills. And here, in our example, it would refer, the skill would refer to overconfidence, that uh, the absence of, of such a skill or the presence of overconfidence is likely to undermine the wisdom of the crowds in our setting because we chose a setting with lots of fake news. We have, by definition, two-thirds of the news that is around is fake. So... You can debate, is this actually realistic to what we see in the media or not? Is it too much or even too little? It's hard to say. I, I don't have good empirical evidence on that. And also the quiz questions were easy. So people were perhaps tempted to think that they are actually better than they are. Nevertheless, this is we said demonstration that this is uh, possible. And it's an extreme demonstration. We have seen with subject, subjective information, zero efficiency, with objective in the last five years, 100% efficiency. So a vast difference. Uh, whether this difference would also be so pronounced under different parameters is to be investigated. One hunch might be that communication uh, or the possibility to vote against your signal may actually help a lot. Uh, this would have to be discussed in more detail. I have actually done a paper with Becky Morton and Marco Piovesan. Uh, published recently, where we allow for such communication and the possibility to vote against your signal in a similar setting, and it didn't help that much. Let me now come to the second topic, which is civic engagement is needed to make the state accountable. The background of this topic is the fundamental finding and the claim in textbooks, actually, that voluntary provision of public goods is even inefficient, at least in large scale, and at least when people are experienced and uh, there is no mechanism to counteract this. So the standard solution to deal with this problem is to have a strong state. The st a strong state can solve the free riding problem and provide the public good, like law and order, environmental protection, or even infrastructure. Well, how can he do this, the strong state? He can mandate citizens to pay taxes and punish them if they don't comply. Use the proceeds of taxation to provide the public good. This is the standard solution as we see it in the textbooks. And it's an old idea. A prerequisite for this is that the punishment is severe. So this is an old idea. Here is the cover of a famous book is called Leviathan. The author is Thomas Hobbes, and he was writing at the time of the British Civil War. 
And this is an allegoric representation of the stake with the symbol of the state, the crown, and the bishop's hook, which is the sign of legitimacy of the ruler or of the state, and the sword. And the sword is the symbol of power of the state, which allows the state to punish the people if they don't comply. And Hobbes taught in writing at times, at terrible times of civil war, where there's chaos and anarchy, he writes, that when men live without the common power to keep them all in awe with their sword, then life of the man is nasty, brutish, and short. So this is an old idea that the Leviathan can, through strong state power, overcome anarchy and provide public goods like law and order and, and environmental protection, which are enormously beneficial. But a strong state also needs to be in check, held in check, because there is the danger that the strong state will lead to oppression and exploitation of citizens. Once the power is there to tax people, they may just extract all the, all the rents from the people. So a recent book by Darren Semoglu and James Robinson uh, argues uh, along these ways, along these lines, that to have a productive interaction of economy, state, and society, you need to have a subtle balance described above that you need to have a strong state, but uh, you need to shackle the Leviathan also, so to constrain the Leviathan, to prevent that the Leviathan actually abuses the theory. And this is difficult to achieve, this is fragile, therefore the title, the narrow corridor. So, but the upshot is, you need to make the state accountable. How can you make the state accountable? There are institutional solutions, it's the famous checks and balances, of course. But democratic states also uh, try to attempt this dilemma of making government accountable by way of elections and the free press. So these devices constrain the government, but they require voluntary civic engagement. If people don't spend their cost, of to be informed, to go to the election, to vote out an incompetent government. If they don't, you know, they don't care about the news, uh, don't political news, this kind of constraint is not going to work. You need civic engagement to provide an accountable state. So one um, important aspect of our research that we had in mind, uh, Kenju and Lewis and I had in mind when we started this research, was that the belief that is actually uh, fostered in the standard textbook that the fundamental problem of providing public goods, like law and order, can be solved by simply imposing a strong state, that this belief is misleading. Because if you just have the strong state and it's not accountable, sooner or later the power is going to be misused and uh, the public goods are not going to be uh, provided. So you need voluntary cooperation to make sure that the state is accountable. Or in other words, the problem of voluntary cooperation does not disappear by just invoking reliance on governmental power and on checks and imbalances. You still need someone to make sure that these checks and balances are actually applied. We have this uh, phrasing, we say, the state can solve the first order public good problem of providing law and order and environmental protection, but there is a second order public goods problem that underpins or makes sure or enables the first order. Civic engagement is needed for accountable public power. These are my co-authors, Kenju and Lewis, and that's the title of our paper, Civic Engagement as a Second Order Public Good. How does it work? Citizens face this main first order public good problem, can be solved, via a deterrent penalty. So it has to be a stiff fine. This is the big sword, the big stick that we saw in the cover of the Leviathan. If people don't pay the taxes, um, and if effective government is in place, then the government can solve this first order problem, but it will only be in place, effective government is only available if there is sufficient civic engagement. Civic engagement is costly, is strictly dominated for a rational, self-interested individual. So people want a free ride if they're rational and self-interested. 
on civic engagement. So they will not provide civic engagement, which means that they will, the first order public good cannot be solved through the stiff sanctions because there are none. But the cost of civic engagement is modest compared to the benefit everyone obtains from having an effective government. So this is a leverage effect that we'll mention later on. The paper is a first cut. We do not study more complex interactions between society, state, and the economy for now. This is already quite complex for a first cut, as you will see in a minute. So this design is novel in a variety of ways. We have civic engagement is represented by a real effort task. I'll show you a picture in a second, which has real world context. The main public good has an interior solution, so it's not as in the standard linear public good games that the social optimum is at full contribution and the private uh, optimum is at zero, but both are in the, uh, uh, the social optimum is in the interior. We frame it as such that we say the public good enhances the productivity of private sector activity and also provides a direct benefit. So it's a more complex structure. Uh, more realistic structure of public goods than is usually studied. We also have fairly large groups of 24 uh, members who share the same public good. So in part one, people just play the, this two layer, this public good games without sanctions and to familiarize themselves with everything. And then in part two, there is the pre-stage where they do the civic engagement. If there's enough civic engagement, then the sanction is there. And if it's there, then contributing 8 out of 20 points is privately and socially optimal. If the sanction is not there, then contributing 0 is privately optimal. 8 would still be socially optimal. So we have treatments that vary the cost of civic engagement and also whether there is some social interaction. So how does it work? So first, let me say that in the pre-stage, People do the real effort task, they have 40 seconds to spend on these tasks and they can choose whether they want to do civic tasks or private tasks. If they do the civic task, for each civic task they do, it raises the probability of having this deterrent sanction in place, having a functioning state in place. But if they do the private task, they just have a private revenue and it doesn't co contribute to having the first order public good solved. So this, we then vary the cost of uh, providing the civic task by varying how attractive the private tasks are. So here's an example of a civic task. Senate candidate Wendy White favors unrestricted gun ownership and is committed to a woman's right to choose whether to continue or to terminate pregnancy. It's an unusual combination for sure, but uh, the point was that you had to move this little figure into the right, right quarter. So in this example, I think you had to move it to the upper right uh, quarter. So, and if you do, then that's one contribution of one uh, civic engagement task. So, private tasks are the same, they look the same, but they are framed in a consumer space, and you, it's only you get a return from it. Uh, not, it doesn't increase the probability of getting uh, the punishment. And it's framed in choice of restaurant versus home meal, so private, private damage. So how does the social interaction work? If there's social interaction, then people, the participants are assigned to a group of six, it's called a social circle, and they can inform the people within their social circle whether they just did a civic engagement task or not. And you can also, in this treatment, you can also give feedback, social approval on a five-point scale. Say, so, you know, great that you did this civic engagement. In control treatment, there's no such uh, social interaction. So to repeat, the parameters are such that nobody should do the civic engagement because it's costly, it's public good. Given that there is no civic engagement, the first order public good is not sold. Yeah, this, the standard prediction, behavioral prediction is there is some social engagement or civic engagement and there's more of it when it's cheap and social interaction promotes engagement. We did this with about 500 people at uh, Brown University in the United States. So in the first three periods when the state is absent by design, we see some contributions to the public good, but it's quickly declining. This is a pretty standard finding. And then absence the state, you know, given that there is no punishment, there are very low contributions of around 
uh, one. So eight would be the efficient level, but here we see uh, about 15% of efficient contribution. But if the state is in place, then the contributions are very close to the social optimum, as you can see here with the red line, it's almost eight. And so when this happens in 42% of the cases, the state is present, but in 58% of the cases, the state is absent. What happens to the number of civic tasks? If in total the group makes 40 civic tasks, then the state is guaranteed to be there. If it's below, then there is just some probability. And you can see the probability is highest when the cost is low and there is social interaction. This is the leftmost bar, and it's lowest when the cost is high and there is no social interaction. And then this translates into the share of periods with sanctions. You can see that about 60% of the cases in low yes, you have the sanctions in place, whereas in high no, uh, it's only 24. So more civic engagement enables sanctions about more than twice as often, but it's still fragile. It's not 100%. It's difficult to achieve. And then finally, you can see what is the contribution as a percent of social optimal. You can see there's a clear ordering uh, <clears throat> as expected according to cost and social interaction. Uh, these uh, four graphs show the amount of civic engagement per capita. And uh, the blue lines show the range in which sanctions are uncertain. So if it's below the lower blue line, the and you're sure you have no sanction. If it's above the upper blue line, you're sure to have a sanction. And in between, there is some probability that the sanction is there. So what can be seen from these graphs and also from regression analysis we do, there is more civic engagement when the cost is low, unsurprisingly. Uh, there is more civic engagement for those who cooperate in period one. So it means that there is some relation to cooperativeness, that they respond positively to fellow social circle members. So if they see someone in the social circle contributed, they're more likely to contribute, but there is no such relation for people outside the social circle within their group. And we see from survey data, we uh, measure later on at the end of the experiment, we see that those who say they are politically interested and engaged, those who follow political events in the media, those who voted in the last US presidential election, these people are more likely to engage in civic tasks in this experiment. So there seems to be some uh, external validity here. The amazing thing, or the most remarkable thing, I think, is that there is no decline in the amount of civic engagement we see. So we don't see, also in regression analysis, we don't see a trend, uh, not the downward trend at least, well, actually no trend at all, except for the first few periods of decline, which is very typical. This is the, the standard finding in uh, public goods games that contributions decline over time. We don't see it here. So why is that? I think one possible interpretation is that the costs of civic engagement are very small compared to the benefits you get from having the state in place. So you can think of this as a kind of leverage effect, which is illustrated here with this lever, uh, so a little civic engagement can solve a big public goods problem by creating the accountable uh, government. And people kind of think, okay, the cost is small, let's do it anyway, even though there's a free rider incentive. So this would parallel the fact that people actually go to vote, even though there's a little small cost to participate in an election. But if nobody participates in the elections, if then democracy is going to fall apart. Many people understand this. They think it's their civic duty, so they, they're willing to bear this cost. So let me summarize what I've said so far. Civic engagement is essential. I have been interested in this topic for many years because of its primordial uh, importance of civic engagement. And to keep up democracy, a functioning democracy and an accountable state, we need to continuously make an effort these institutions fall apart if without civic engagement. So it's, I think it's very important to study this topic and this is, has been an understudied topic in, uh, in economics at least. I already mentioned the, the phenomenon that there is large scale participation in elections all around the world. Many people participate in elections and this is a big puzzle to the standard econ literature. It's not so much a puzzle if you see it through the perspective of civic engagement. 
Of course, there are other possible explanations also, but this is uh, one, one aspect of it. So I think it's very useful to have experiments on this topic. We have seen, I presented a study showing that voter ignorance is not as bad as predicted. So there is this concern that voters are not as well informed as you would hope, but it's actually not as bad as you would think. However, fake news have harmful effects, and we look at it in a situation where it's likely to have a harmful effect because there's lots of fake news around. If the voters are not sufficiently sophisticated, fake news can be very harmful, and naive civic engagement, which would mean, you know, it's my obligation to vote, not reflecting whether your news is fake or not, then this may backfire. So I think here, uh, civic education can be quite important to understand or the ability to deal with fake news, but there might also be institutional fixes to that, uh, to have a free and strong uh, press, for example. So finally, I talked about this leverage effect in the second paper, which is the remarkable finding that civic engagement is fairly persistent. People make a small effort because they know it can have a huge benefit. And it's surprisingly persistent, but in our experiment, it was also fragile. So it means that we need to be careful about this. We need to make this continuous effort to keep up functioning democracy and an accountable state. Thank you very much.